¿Cansado de estar acostado y sin dormir, esperando tener unas pocas horas de sueño? Consigue el sueño que buscas con el inigualable Tempur-Pedic. Solo Tempur-Pedic usa su exclusivo material Tempur, que continuamente se adapta y responde a tu cuerpo para reducir la presión. Para que consigas un sueño profundo, sin interrupciones, el Summer of Sleep de Tempur-Pedic es ahora mismo. Aprovecha nuestra mejor oferta del año y siente tu mejor dormir del verano. Todos los colchones Tempur-Pedic están en oferta, con selectos ahorros de hasta 500 dólares. Infórmate más en tempurpedic.com. Allstate now has deeper savings, and deeper savings require deep thoughts and a deep voice, like mine. Save for being a new customer, save more for adding DriveWise, and save even more for driving safely. Visit Allstate.com or click to get a quote. Find out how much you can save today. As someone once said, saving today is money tomorrow. That's deep. Not available in every state. New customer savings based on early signing discount. Drive Ice is an optional feature. Savings vary based on how you buy. Subject to terms and conditions. Allstate Fire and Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Northbrook, Illinois.
47 kids. I cannot believe we had that many kids in Awana. It was amazing, guys. I mean, that was just an incredible Awana night. And so we, we've got other churches we know that haven't even started Awana yet. They're still waiting to see what their schools are going to do. Uh, the church I came from, from Omaha, very large club. They haven't started theirs yet either. They're trying to figure out how they're going to do that. But we at least are able to minister here. And that is an amazing thing because the gospel is, that's the most important thing. A little inconvenient. It's a little stressful on the leaders. i got to tell you, teaching wearing a face mask is no fun. I hate it. I'm a slow talker, and so you think I have time to catch my breath? <laughs> all right. Anyway, it's just no fun. Let's leave it at that. All right. So it, it is. It's, it's terribly inconvenient for the leaders, but you know what? Just so kids can hear the gospel, it's worth it. And we're glad we had that many kids here this week, and we're hoping to have more. And it's really fun. We got new leaders coming in. It's a great year for that. We have well, even like okay, some of you, you saw some strange faces up here this morning. Okay, besides mine, some different faces. All right. And Phyllis was up here this morning. Phyllis, it's so glad to have you on the worship team. She sang on the worship team in a previous church, and now she's up here singing with us. And this is great to be going in the worship team. We're really good. Now, a few other things has happened. You guys, of course, noticed the new speakers around the sanctuary. Let us know how the sound is, okay? We want to know how the sound is. If it's any better, if it's not any better, if you really don't care, say, Pastor, whatever. All right? That's fine, too. But just know that we're hopefully... We made some new improvements this week on that. We're going to be learning the system, trying to figure things out. But it's here, it's in, it's awesome, and so far we're loving it. And let me tell you, we can have some pretty good jam sessions throughout the week. You want to come up here and pay, Pastor, let's play, let's play this song really, really loud. I will play that song really, really loud for you. It'll be awesome. We'll sing together. It'll be a great time. But we're just praising God for that. But, man, you want it. that was just an amazing thing. You want it. There's a couple things in there about Bible studies starting. This Thursday, there's a women's Bible study that starts. We want you to be aware of that. Of course, every Tuesday at 6, there's a men's study that meets. Every Tuesday morning at 6. That's on our calendar there on the inside of the bulletin. We have an Awana Leaders meeting coming up on September 14. Be aware of that. September 14, Awana Leaders meeting. There's an announcement about Operation Christmas Child. Now is the time to start buying your objects for Operation Christmas Child. It's definitely the time to do that. And, of course, our offering plates are not passing those yet. They're here. We have two offering plates here, and then we have one in each lobby. If at the end of the service you can give just your tithes and offerings, that would be greatly appreciated, supporting the ministries of our church and our missionaries. We, we need that from you guys. Now, this week is the last week for Dave and Sarah Fector. They're moving to Wisconsin this week. So, Dave and Sarah, we're going to miss you, especially when it comes time to get something off the top shelf in the kitchen. Because you stand, what, six foot seven? Somewhere in there? Six six. Six six. He's also handy to have around, let me tell you, all right? We're gonna miss you guys. So we were glad you guys have been here part of our family for a while. I gotta take Isaac deer hunting last year, we got his first Nebraska deer, good times. But we're gonna miss him. So if you guys have a chance after the service, just wish him well, pray for him, pray with him. That'd be great. What day are you guys meeting? Next week, uh, Saturday. Next week's Saturday. And every time you come back, you promise to bring curds with you, right? It's constant curds, right? Is that? Yeah, we'll bring lots of cheese curds. Lots of cheese curds. Okay, that'll be awesome. So, but guys, we're going to miss you a lot. So, but thanks for letting us know that. So, we appreciate that. So, if you have a chance to give them well wishes after service, if you can, you're going to do so. All right. I think that's all we're going to do here. I'm going to. After. Sir, yes, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Dorothy and I are going to be. September 1st. It's our 30th wedding anniversary. 30 and years. So we're inviting everybody, <laughs> inviting everybody uh, next Sunday at between 2 to 5 to have a drive through our place here in Grand in St. Paul, 426th Street. And uh, we're going to give everybody a cupcake and a bottle of water. So. <laughs> So, Lynn and Dorothy celebrate your 30th next Sunday, and we're, so September 1st is actually your 30th anniversary, but you're going to celebrate it next Sunday from 2 to 5 at your home here in St. Paul, and you're going to hand out cupcakes and bottles of water. How many times can you go through? Well, only one cupcake. Only one cupcake, right? You keep going through only one cupcake. Well, yeah, you can come to the house, too, you know. Oh, there we go. Okay, so if you want to see the house that they inherited and then redid, so and it's beautiful. It's a beautiful home. You guys are welcome to do that also. 
So thank you guys. All right, next Sunday, two to five, drive through car shower for Glenn and Dorothy for the 30th. That's awesome. Very good. Thank you guys for sharing that. In a couple of weeks, we're going to have a guy by the name of Dr. Larry Moyer be here at Grace. And Dr. Moyer is going to, well, let's back up just a minute. Grace exists. You see this in your bulletin. Grace exists to make mature followers of Jesus Christ. That's why we are here. That's the purpose of our church. And Dr. Larry Moore is going to come in, and he's going to help us in one little avenue of this, one, one little area, really, of this. As he comes in, he's going to be talking about evangelism. He has a heart for evangelism. And so he's got a little video I want you guys to watch. We're going to play it this week and next week, in case we miss somebody. Just a little one-and-a-half-minute video that I want you to watch concerning this thing that Larry's going to come and do. He's going to speak on Sunday morning during the service, and then he's going to speak after the service, do a training after the service during the Sunday school hour. Kids' Sunday school classes will have begun by then. You're going to be able to put your kids in their sexual classes, and all the adults will meet in here. And then after that, we'll have a potluck. We'll have a lunch here. The deacons are supplying the meat, but we need you guys to bring just the sides of the dessert. All this is in the newsletter, which you should get a copy of. If you don't get a copy of the newsletter, let me know. We'll get you the newsletter detailing this out. But then after the potluck, you're going to be meeting with some of the leadership as well. And so just be aware of this, but I think this is going to be a really good thing. Eric, go ahead and kick it off, and let's see what you want to talk about. The workplace has been called the next movement of God in America. The reason is, in a day when unbelievers are so approachable, believers are having some of the best opportunities they've ever had to witness the people they spend most of their time with, the people they work alongside of every day. However, people in the workplace often face two problems. One is they are so intimidated by what they cannot do in the workplace, they miss out on what they can do. A second and even bigger problem, though, is that believers in the workplace have been told the importance of being a person of character and integrity. The problem is they already know that. What they don't know is as a person of character and integrity, how do I cultivate my relationship with non-Christians? How and when and where do I share Christ? What exactly do I tell them? How do I overcome my fears? How do I respond to Christian objections? How and when do I use my own story? Hence, fear and lack of know-how holds them back. Join us for this Workplace Evangelism Seminar. Seeing your workplace as your mission field, you will leave knowing how you can make the most lasting impact in the workplace that you have ever made. Remember, everyone you meet is going to live forever. The only question is where. God wants you to make the difference right there in your workplace. Very, very good. And I hope that you guys can be able to be here on that Sunday, September 13th, and hear him present. It's just an important thing for us at the church that we realize that in this world around us, especially in St. Paul, we have a very large mission field. I was talking to another pastor this last week here in St. Paul and just made comment that statistically speaking, Statistically speaking, less than 200 people in St. Paul, less than 200 people believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven and the Bible is true as it's written. That means over 2,000 people in St. Paul, statistically speaking, do not believe the Bible is true as it's written and do not believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven. We have a huge mission field just in St. Paul. So I'm hoping you guys will come as together we as a church can influence. You sit there and think, what happens if everybody in our church influences one? one year, and then you add that, you multiply that out, the next year everybody there influences one. In just a short amount of time, we're influencing the whole town of St. Paul. The whole town. And I want you guys to come to that training so that you can help help me, help the leaders, because together we're doing this. This is a mission for all of us. God has said, Jesus in Matthew 28 said to all of us, he said, go. It's not just for pastors, it's for everyone to go. And so I hope you guys can come and be part of that. All right. We've got a couple things to pray about here in our bulletins. Just a few things before we go to the before we get to the service. We have Converge Heartland Annual Meeting is coming up in just a few weeks. We're going to pray for that. Alwyn and Sharon Weiss, uh, they're still praying for their school down there. Uh, we have their, their schools, they, they can't afford to pay as many staff members, but the tasks that have to be done are just as large. And so they're trying to do as much with less. And sometimes you guys know what that's like, how frustrating that is. So continue to pray for them and their school down there in Mexico. It's a very important thing that they're doing. So continue to pray for them. Again, we're going to pray for the effectors as they move this week. Keep them in your prayers. Pat Hutchison has had a heart procedure come up in a couple weeks. Pray for Pat Hutchison and her heart procedure as well. And a few other things mentioned there, but we're just going to get on into prayer here and kick off our, our sermon time. Father God, 
Lord, there's just a lot happening in our world around us. I know everybody in this room has a lot happening in their lives, and they come to church, and sometimes sometimes it's hard to shut our minds off. Sometimes it's hard to, to forget what, what all is going on around us. But for this little bit of time, Lord, I'm praying that we'd be able to focus just for a moment on your word. Be able to learn something from you today. God, you've got a lot for us. We're praying for these requests. We're praying for the factors as they move. We pray that you would help them as they load their vehicles, as they get everything packed up, as they travel up there. We pray to keep their objects safe, keep them safe. Bless them as they begin this new endeavor in their lives, Lord. I pray you watch over them. We pray so much for our Wana program, which kicked off this week. We praise you for the kids that came. We're asking for more kids with the leadership, be with our kiddos. Lord, help us with this. We do pray for fruit this year in our Wana program. That somehow through this, at least one child will come and place their faith in you. Pray for us as a church as we continue to grow, as we continue to minister, as we try to reach people, Lord. I am asking that you would use us for your glory, Lord. And that's what we want. We want to be this small church with a large impact. We pray for our missionaries. I'm asking them, God that you would keep them safe. Continue to give them a passion. Continue to encourage them. It's hard when you're overseas. It's hard when you're out of the country. It's hard just frankly being in ministry. And I pray the Lord that you would help keep them encouraged. Father, we thank you for the many blessings you've given us, for the things that we have for you, for the ability you have to heal us. We think of Pat Hutchison who's having a heart procedure here coming up quickly. I pray that that would go well. Lord, I pray that you would continue just to be with her and be with her healing too as she comes from that. God, for our time today as we're doing this service, I pray that again you just be with us all. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. I'm frantically searching for my clicker because I can't remember where to put it down at, and I found it. We're going to need this. Inside your bulletin, inside your bulletin is a fill-in-the-blank sheet. It's a sermon outline for those of you who are new here today or visiting for the first time. Kind of help you track along with what's going on. We're talking today about the good, the bad, and the ugly, part three. The good, the bad, and the ugly, part three. We're in Revelation 11, 12, and 13. Right in the middle of our series on the end times. Okay? Right in the middle of our series on the end times. Of course, if you've been here before, you understand what we're talking about. When I talk about the end times, I'm talking about the period leading up to the judgment day. So everything prior to the judgment day that God talks about in his word. And that encompasses many, many, many years. You have the tribulation period, that's seven years long. You have the millennial kingdom, which is a thousand years long. And time frames in between that, where we're not exactly sure how long some of those things are. So we have a time frame that's all-encompassing, and it's over several, several, several years, okay? But all it's referred to as the end times, the period leading up to the judgment day. We're talking about that. The period leading up to the judgment day. We talked about Revelation chapter 11. We talked about the good in Revelation chapter 11, where it had the two witnesses that were there. And then we went to Revelation chapter 12, we had another good person, which is the woman who represents Israel. And then we went to the bad, in Revelation 12, we're introduced to Satan. And now today, we're going to meet the ugly. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Today, we're going to get through one of these, one of these uh, characters as mentioned there in Revelation chapter 13. Next week, we're going to do the second one, who's called the false prophet. Today, we're talking about the Antichrist. Next week, the false prophet. Then we have a break for Larry Morgan to be here, and then after that, we're going to talk about the Mark of the Beast. We're going to spend one week on the Mark of the Beast. We're going to talk about what is the Mark of the Beast, what isn't the Mark of the Beast, what do we know about it, what do we not know about it, and then following that, we'll have another Q&A time like we did a few weeks ago. That Q&A time was well received, and we're going to try to do that again in just a few weeks, all right? So be aware of that, know that that's coming up. But we're slowly working our way through this. I know when I started this last July, I said it was going to be 10 weeks long. Well... This is my 10th Sunday, so I can end it now if you want me to, or we can keep going, all right? Because there's just so much stuff here. I prefer to keep going, mainly because I have two other certain written and be about to throw them away, right? They get too sad. <laughs> but just know that we're moving along in this. It's going to be a while, but I hope you're enjoying it as we talk about the end times. Again, today is just a reminder of where we're at. Today is talking about the, the ugly, which is the Antichrist. Understanding that the Antichrist is real, and he's worse than any movie, any book, anything you've ever read outside of God's word. He's worse than what they've tried to portray him. Today we're going to study the Antichrist of Revelation learn what the world should expect from this person controlled by Satan himself. The Antichrist. In the last two end times messages, they did about the two witnesses. Mention that. The woman, the red dragon, you see. All of them are mentioned in Revelation 11 and 12. Okay? Today we're going to be in Revelation 13. Revelation 13 is where we're at today. So if you want to turn your Bible there to Revelation 13, that's fine. I'll have the verses on the screen as well. Those of you who are, who 
or not yes, you understand that. But Revelation chapter 13, as we're going to look directly at God's word, see what God has to say about this person that we call the Antichrist. Mark Hitchcock says this. He said, some estimate that since the days of Adam, approximately 100 billion human beings have been born. However, the greatest human, apart from Jesus himself, has yet to make his appearance on the planet. Now, he's not talking about the greatest as far as goodness. He's talking about the greatest as far as influence. And the Antichrist will have, apart from Jesus himself, will have the greatest influence on this earth that anyone has ever had. Again, apart from Jesus himself. That's the Antichrist. His influence is going to be huge here on this earth. In fact, all-encompassing around the whole world. A.W. Pink says this, Across the varied scenes depicted by prophecy, there falls a shadow of a figure at once commanding and ominous. Under many different names, like the aliases of a criminal, his character and movements are set before us. Anybody ever seen that Alfred Hitchcock movie, Psycho? Please say no. All right. All right. Every now and then you get a glimpse of there's You know there's a bad guy. You're not exactly sure who it is, but you know there's a bad guy. And a lot of horror movies is that way. You know, you'll see a hand, you'll see a foot, you see something, you know there's something coming that's pure evil. In Revelation, we see basically the shadow, we see the hand, we see the foot. We don't get necessarily a complete glimpse of everything, such as who he is and when is he going to be born, right? I'd love to know that. We don't have that, but we know that evil is coming. And that we're promised in God's word. The evil personified in the Antichrist. The person we know of as the Antichrist. Now it's interesting, look at the word Antichrist. The word Antichrist is only found in the epistles of John. It's not mentioned in Revelation at all. In this book that writes the most about the Antichrist, now there are many other books that mention him, the only one that refers to him as the Antichrist is John in his epistles. John says this, Children is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now, so now many antichrists have come, therefore we know that it is the last power. You tend to read that verse like, wait a minute, is there one antichrist or are there many antichrists? Which one is it? Is he here now? Is he not here now? Bear with me, we're going to explain this in just a second, all right? We're just understanding where the phrase antichrist comes from. I want you to know that I'm not making this up. I want you to know that I did not read my news on Facebook this week and pull this name out of something, all right? This is a real name taken from the scriptures, the antichrist. In the Gospels, we see the phrase, the false Christ. And that's found only in the Gospels, the false Christ. Jesus refers to this. For false Christ and false prophets will arise, perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect, even those who are believers in Christ, will try to lead them astray. Now, it's interesting, when you look at the epistles of John, and you look at what Jesus said, we're kind of talking about two different things. The Antichrist of John seems to refer to a philosophy denying there is a Christ, the Antichrist of the Gospels is a person claiming to be Christ. The false Christ. I am Christ, no one else is. I am the Messiah, no one else is. So you have two different things. You have John talking about a philosophy, and you have Jesus talking about a person. But if you look at 2 Thessalonians, you see where both of these thoughts are combined into one passage. Where the answer is, well, who is the Antichrist? Is it a philosopher or is it a person? Well, the answer is an easy answer, and the answer is yes. It's both. Look at what Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians. Let no one deceive you in any way. For that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Now this is specifically talking about a person, right? This is obviously talking about a person. The man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. He's going to be revealed. Who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship. So that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. So a false Christ, claiming to be Christ. All right? In verse 5, Paul kind of goes on to talk about this. He said, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed at this time. Talk about the restrainer. Now, I'm not going to do a lot of backtracking here. But we see the restrainer, who we believe is the Holy Spirit. The restrainer is now restraining this man of lawlessness. Okay? Well, what is the man of lawlessness? Well, let's go on. Let's, let's think about this for just a second. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. The mystery of lawlessness, that is the philosophy that John addresses. We have the lawless one, the son of destruction, who's a person, but his philosophy is already at work. For this mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he's out of the way. So the Holy Spirit, John chapter 16, verse 8, who is here to convict the world of sin, 
righteousness and judgment, as I said before, he's kind of the mom of the world. And the back of your mind is saying, this isn't necessarily what you need to be doing. But he's convicting the world, not just believers, convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. When you pick out, when you pull that convicting spirit out of the world, and all of a sudden there is no more conscience for anybody, what do you do? When you don't have conscience, how do you respond? How do you act? In a very bad way. Well, that mystery of lawlessness, that desire to do evil, is prevalent in today's world and is being restrained by the Holy Spirit, but someday he will be gone. So the philosophy of the Antichrist will be running rampant, as will the Antichrist himself, who will be revealed when the restrainer is lifted. We don't know when that will be. We wish we had a date, but we don't. But it's going to happen. And what we believe is that when the Holy Spirit is lifted, because God has promised the Holy Spirit to us as believers, when he's lifted, we are lifted at the same time, so that God can keep his promise to us in an event we call the rapture. So we will not be here for that. All right? So just understand that. But when we talk about the Antichrist, it is a person, yes, it is also a philosophy. John writes in Revelation 11 and 13 about his vision of the beast, who is the person of the Antichrist. In Revelation chapter 11, John says this. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. I want you to think about this phrase, Revelation chapter 11, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit. We're going to be back to this. We're going to visit this here in just a second, all right? We're going to revisit it. But the beast that rises from the bottomless pit, called the Antichrist, the beast. Revelation 12, 17. We had this verse last time. We talked about Satan. We introduced Satan. And we saw Satan after he pursued the people of Israel, and they hid in the place that we call Petra. And I explained to you why I thought it was Petra. Again, just my opinion. But why I think it was Petra they're going to hide at. And then Satan turns from that. After losing the people who inhabit Israel now, Satan turns to that. Here's what he does. Then the dragon became furious with the woman. Those are Israelites who God protected. And went off to make war on the rest of her offspring. On those who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. So not just Israelites, but the believers as well. And he stood on the sand of the sea. So John is envisioning this where Satan is there in Palestine looking out over the Mediterranean Sea. This is what we believe he's seeing. And he sees this figure. He sees Satan himself staring out over the water. Looking to the west, staring out over the water. And we closed our, our sermon two weeks ago just picturing the film ending at that point where the bad guy, having lost what he thought was everything, staring out over the water. The problem is, is that that was only part one. There's a part two because out of the water while they stand there emerges this. I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. While Satan was there, staring out over the water, John sees this. It's the very next verse. John sees this happen. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. That's a pretty ugly creature. Now you know why I call it the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? So we have the good. We have the witnesses in Israel. We have the bad, Satan. That's obvious. And now we have the ugly. And this dude is ugly. This is what we have. But the interesting thing about this is that Daniel talks about somebody who portrays this perfectly. Daniel, in his own writings back in the Old Testament, thousands of years before John wrote, Daniel saw this. I desire to know the truth about the fourth beast, who Daniel saw in a vision, which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying, with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze, and which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left of its feet. A beast that Daniel saw, a beast that's also, we can put these things together, it's apparent is the Antichrist. The ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn that came up, and before which three of them fell. The horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things, and that seemed greater than its companions. The beast is the greatest of all the world leaders. And Daniel in his visions was talking about the, the first, the second, and third beast were all world leaders that have already lived. This fourth beast, this fourth world leader, has yet to live, has yet to come into existence. The horns mentioned in Daniel and in Revelation describe his great political influence and his control. Because he will have great political influence, he will have great control. John writes in Revelation, the whole earth marvel as they followed the beast. And they worshiped the dragon, that's Satan, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? See how encompassing that is? The whole earth marvel as they followed the beast. This is not just one country being affected. It's not just a small union of countries being affected. This is the whole earth that's following the beast. Well, John and Daniel said this guy's going to have a huge influence on the world. A huge political influence on the world. Authority is given it over every tribe and people 
and language and nation. This has never been seen before, the amount of influence this person has just in that short amount of time. Christianity has spread to the world, absolutely. But it's taken how many years? A lot. Thousands of years. We're going to see here in a little bit, this is going to happen within three and a half years. His influence over the whole world will happen in a very short amount of time. Mark Hitchcock, in his book, The End, he wrote about some characteristics of the Antichrist. I want to share some of those with you. Some things that we can expect to see from the Antichrist. Some things that happen to him, some things that he does, some of the abilities that he has. And these will be fascinating for us as we discover this man is not going to be, he's, he's not going to be a weak person. He's going to be a man of great power. He's going to claim to be God. He's going to have these plans. He's going to get there. He's going to claim to be God. He's going to think, well, that's insane. How can he claim to be God? Well, he's going to claim to be God. We're going to see why here in just a minute as he thinks about this. But no one deceive you in any way. For that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. I want to take a pause here for just a moment. If you remember back, though, it's been seven or eight weeks now, we talk about this word rebellion in this verse. Seven out of 11 times in the New Testament, this Greek word is actually translated departure. Here in 2 Thessalonians, English translators translated it rebellion. So again, you look at the idea from the, idea from the perspective of rapture, you can read this, but no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the departure comes first. The departure of the restrainer, the departure of the church at the same time. The man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. The Antichrist will proclaim to be God. And you wonder, how can he proclaim to be God? Well, bear with me for involved in this, because he's going to talk about this. He's going to blaspheme God. He's going to get God, he's basically going to try to discredit God. What is he going to do? It opened his mouth, this is Revelation, it, that's the beast. Open his mouth to utter blasphemies against God. Blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. He's going to blaspheme God. He's going to be able to do miracles. So then they think, well, only God can do miracles. That's what people are going to believe. And Satan also has power. And Satan influencing the Antichrist at this point, he's going to give the Antichrist his power. We're going to understand the Antichrist has the ability to do miracles in his mind, in the world's mind, proving that he's God. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. He will be able to do false signs, wonders, miracles. He'll be able to do it. It will look real. They will be real for all intents and purposes. And he will claim to be God. This is the power this man's going to have. He will suffer a violent death. We believe this happens halfway through the tribulation. Just when the Antichrist really emerges for who he is. To be a violent death. Revelation describes it this way. Revelation chapter 13. One of his heads seemed to have a mortal wound. So John, his vision, saw this person, this beast, who had a mortal wound on his head. Seen that a mortal wound. Now, if you go on ahead in just a few verses, you're going to see where this person with a mortal wound was resurrected. Brought back to life. Again, giving further credence to the point that this guy is gone. He has the power over death. Look what John says in Revelation chapter 13, 3. One of his heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but his mortal wound was healed. He came back to life. In every book that I've got out there on my desk and in there today, you go and look, I've got a big stack of them. Every one of those believes that the Antichrist is killed and then is resurrected, giving further evidence of the fact, or giving him credence to that claim that I am God. I can defeat death. I have the ability to do miracles. The Antichrist is going to be a very big influence. He's going to have charisma like you wouldn't believe. People are going to follow him. They're going to want to follow him. They're not just going to be forced into it. They're going to desire to call this person because of what he shows. And it, the false prophet, we're going to talk about next week, exercises all the authority of the first beast. That's the Antichrist in his presence. He makes the earth and his inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. A mortal wound. A wound to death. His wound was healed. He was resurrected, brought back to life. And now the false prophet, the kick in the side, so to speak, some call it sidekick, was there to help him really convince the world to worship him, which won't be that hard because of what we see in his power, what we see in the events around his life. So I'm content at this point, the Antichrist becomes inhabited by Satan. I can either argue for or against this, all right? So think about that. This person, the Antichrist, is a real human being. 
And we see how he comes out, he makes a peace treaty with Israel. We talked about that. The first three and a half years is a peace treaty in the tribulation. But then he receives this mortal wounds. Halfway through the tribulation, he receives a mortal wound. You say, how do you know it's halfway? Bear with me, I'll show you this. Halfway through the tribulation, he receives this mortal wound. And at this point, there are many who believe that Satan then actually possesses the body of the Antichrist, bringing him to life. Is that true? I'm not sure. I'm not going to argue for it or against it. The only thing I would say is that if you go back to Revelation 11, that verse that I talked to you about, we're talking about the beast who came from the bottomless pit. The beast that came from the bottomless pit. The only, if you take that passage where Satan comes from the bottomless pit and has a person who, the Antichrist, is, he's a born person just like us. He's a human being just like us. And so is it the beast inhabited by another beast? Is it a person like us inhabited by Satan from the bottomless pit? It's possible you can take that interpretation. All I know is that he is heavily influenced by Satan himself. Controlled even by Satan. Is he possessed? I don't know. I'm not going to say one way or another. It could be. I can't argue for or against that. All I know is that Satan gives him his control. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. So Satan himself instills this person with all of his power with his throne. With great authority. That is an amazing thing to think about. And when I say amazing, I mean amazing and that should give you chills. Because you're seeing somebody who has the ability to wreak great havoc on this earth. Spiritually, physically. Do some very terrible things. And God's allowing it to happen. People will worship him. In spite of the evilness that is within him, people are going to worship this person. We've already talked about this just a little bit. Authority is given over a tribe and people and language and nation. So what, what do you get if you live in a world where you're one person who's been still with evil, with still the power to do everything wrong, to be all sorts of evil, and yet you live in a world where people look at you and you can do no wrong. So you have the power given to you by Satan to do as much wrong as you want, and yet you worship as the world, the world worships you as a perfect being who can do no wrong. You are making the laws. You are making the rules at this point. And everybody's like, yeah, we'll go along with that. This is the guy. We're going to follow him. And yet everything you do is evil. And they say, but yeah, we love this guy. All the dwellers on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the Lamb who was slain. So those who dwell with people on this earth will worship it except those who are believers. We talk about the fact there will be some in the tribulation. Many place their faith in Christ during the tribulation period. And you sit there and you gotta wonder just a little bit, well, why in the world, why in the world would all this happen to those guys as well? Why would why would there be, be people there in the tribulation that are gonna to have to go through a hard time themselves, even though they're believers? Why would that happen? We're gonna see here just a little bit what's gonna to happen to those saints. But you've got to remember that the tribulation is the time of God's wrath being poured on this earth for the rejection of him and his son, which the world has systemically done for years now, thousands of years we've rejected Christ. And so everyone, God's going to judge the whole earth for that. Some will repent. Some will turn to faith in Christ during this time. But as we know, just because you say you're sorry does not remove the consequences for your actions. That happens in marriage. That happens in life. I can stand before a judge and I can say I'm sorry for speeding down the road and accidentally hitting a pedestrian. I can say that, but it doesn't change the consequence of what I'm about to endure. Even though I may be very sorry. Tribulation is the same way. We may be very sorry. There may be people in the tribulation who wish they could listen earlier, but they're still going to have to go through it. Because that's part of what happens. Forgiveness does not mean the end of consequences. In yellow, the beast, he makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast. The first beast will be worshipped by the world. The whole world. And that's amazing to sit and think about. He reigns for three and a half years. This is how we believe this, this resurrection happens in three and a half years' time. Because we see in both Revelation and in Daniel, we see these words... The beast was given a month, a mouth, sorry, a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words. It was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. So it rises from the sea, Satan gives it its power, and then for 42 months. So if you want to say it this way, he rises from the sea, Satan inhabits him, inhabits him. Maybe that's possible. For 42 months, three and a half years, it was given power, exercise authority. Daniel says this. He shall speak words against the most high shall wear out the saints of the Most High, shall think to change the times and the law. They shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and a half a time. So again, in Daniel, the time is a year, times is two years, half a time is half a year. So you have one year and two years is three plus half a year is three and a half years, 42 months. 
Daniel and Revelation perfectly match one another as they say this Antichrist will be given the ability to reign for three and a half years. And remember what I said about here's a man who has the ability to do all evil, and yet everybody looks at him and says he can do no evil. You see these verses right here. He shall think to change the times and the law. Whatever he wants to do, he will be able to do, and people are going to be okay with it. He will have the power to rule with complete immunity. Diplomatic immunity, wherever he wants to go, whatever he wants to do, he will have it. People are going to follow him, and he can change whatever law he wants, and yet in the eyes of the world, he can do no wrong. They will continue to worship him. He persecutes believers. We talked about this already, how the sign of tribulation is not going to be fun for believers. He's going to persecute believers. Daniel said this, As I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them. The verse we just got done reading. He shall speak words against the Most High. He shall wear out the saints of the Most High. He shall think to change the times and the law. And they shall be given into his hand for a time, times and half a time. For a while, it's going to be, and I don't use this word lightly, it's going to be hell on earth for believers. And God will allow this to happen for a short amount of time. But it's going to be really bad on this earth for those who will not worship the beast. It's going to be terrible. He's going to persecute and he's going to seemingly win. Revelation chapter 13, verse 7, John's vision. Was that he was allowed, the beast, it, also it, that's the beast, the Antichrist, was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. Just like God let his own people live in Egypt for 400 years in slavery, God allows his own people to go through this time of tribulation, to be conquered, so to speak, by this Antichrist. The good news is, and I love this good news, in the end, he's going to lose. Three and a half years seems like an eternity. Forty-two months when you go through a time of persecution, it's going to seem like forever. But in the end, he's going to lose. I like what Daniel says. The court shall sit in judgment, and his dominion, that's the Antichrist, his dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end. John even writes a little bit more picturesque for us here. Assuming my clicker works. The beast was captured. With it, the false prophet, who in his presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. And these two were thrown alive in a lake of fire that burns with sulfur. Again, we'll talk about the false prophet next week, the mark of the beast in three weeks. But understand, he's going to live for, he's going to live for a while. He's going to be a real person. We know that. He's going to reign for a while, but he's going to lose for a long time, for eternity. He's going to burn in a lake of fire that burns with sulfur. So what do we know about today's sermon? What, what's our conclusions here? Well, a few things. Number one, first, he's a real person. A real person that is yet to be revealed. He's not yet been revealed, okay? But he is a very real person. Now, in our Q&A we had a few weeks ago, there was an interesting point that I want to reiterate today, okay? As we discussed in our Q&A, Satan does not know when Christ's return will happen. Therefore, there must always be someone Satan is grooming to be the Antichrist. That point number one where I said the Antichrist is yet to be revealed, in theory... Biblically speaking, and this is not just my opinion, biblically speaking, right now, the Antichrist of Revelation 13 could be alive on this earth. He just has not yet been revealed. Every generation has had an Antichrist walking this earth that was never revealed because God said it's not yet time. Jesus himself said, the Son of Man does not know when his time will come, when his hour will come. He didn't know when he could come back to this earth. Satan does not know when, Satan is, when Jesus is coming back. When he's going to rapture his saints, when tribulation begins. Satan does not know this. Satan always has somebody he's grooming for this position. Always. You go back over history and you think, well, who were those people? Is it possible that Hitler was him? It's possible. You see what Hitler did to the Jews? It's very possible. You can see some of the world leaders who went back to these things. Some would say with Nero. Was Nero a possibility of being an antichrist? Absolutely. He was this possibility. A lot of different people who look back over the history of time and see individuals that we look back to well, what if that was a person that Satan was grooming? I can't say yes or no, but I can say it's possible. Even today, there is a potential Antichrist alive and breathing. That is a sobering thought for us. It should be a sobering thought for us because the time is short. Our time is short. We don't know when it's going to end. This gets us to our so what section. What do we do with this? Here's the thing. We cannot change what's coming. I cannot change the fact that revelation is prophesied by God and it's going to happen. I cannot change that. You cannot change that. The Antichrist really will come. The rapture really will happen. Those who believe in Christ will be taken from this earth 
and will be saved from this tribulation. Many will go through it. Many who are believers will go through it. Many will be killed during the tribulation. John says an untold number will be martyred during the tribulation. We'll see that in Revelation chapter 7. It's going to happen. I cannot change what's going to happen. However, I can change who it will affect. I have a possibility of influencing others so that they can place their faith in Christ so that this will not affect them in a negative way. It's going to happen. Even now, there's a potential Antichrist living, and I have the possibility of affecting my neighbors, my friends, people in our community, so that they do not have to be here when he's revealed. The question is this. Are you going to allow God to burden you with this? Paul writes in 2 Corinthians. Paul writes these words, and all of these words that Paul says this in 2 Corinthians because it's a very important phrase for us to think about. Think about our time becoming short. He says this. Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. In other words, don't hold on to this for yourself. Don't just keep this for yourself. The very next verse, for he says, in a favorable time, I listen to you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Jesus says that. He says, look, I listen to you. I provided salvation for you, but is now the time for somebody else? Are you willing to do something? Now may be the day for your neighbor. Now may be the day for your friends. Now may be the day for the guy that you meet at the grocery store. I don't know. The question is, are you convicted of the fact that time is short? Does it terrify us thinking the Antichrist could be living now and that our people that we know could get to meet him face to face? That should terrify us. In the video at the very beginning, Dr. Larry Moore gave a quote at the very end that I really liked. It's a sobering thought to think about. Everyone you meet is going to live forever. The only question is where. Guys, we have grace. We exist to be mature followers of Jesus Christ. The first part of that is actually introducing them to Christ. Helping people become a follower of Christ. We have a job to do. We have a task to do. And this is not just some fascinating study where we're going through a bunch of things that's really not going to affect us. Well, that's true. This should inspire us. It should scare us for those people that we know. It should. So what are you going to do about it? I don't have the answer to that. It's only up to you. But come. Again, I'm just going to throw this thing out there. In two weeks, we're going to have an opportunity for you to be trained so that you can know and have more confidence and want to say how to respond, how you can share the gospel, influencing people who are going to live forever. It's up to us to help influence them so that they don't have to live forever in hell, which God talks about as a real place. God, your word is sobering to us. This whole sermon was sobering to me personally as I sat and thought about this, this idea that indeed our time is short. It's coming to an end. We don't know when it's going to happen. We just know it's coming. Father, I pray for us as the church as we sit and think about people that we know who could, in a very short amount of time, who could come face to face with the end of Christ. And all the power of Satan. Lord, I pray for us as a church as we sit there and think about this and how we can respond. Lord, I pray you give us wisdom, give us a passion, give us a desire to influence others for you. Because today may be their day of salvation, Lord. Help us to live our lives in such a way as to believe the truth of that verse. My ask this in Jesus' name.